Merry Christmas, church. We are in December. Good to have you all here. Good to have you folks joining us online. And I got to tell you, this fall for our church and coming into Christmas season, I keep meeting people every week who um, are brand new to our church. And they said, you know what? We love Calvary. We want to be a part of Calvary. And every Sunday, we're seeing people give their lives to Jesus Christ for the first time. So that's exciting news, church. Let's give the Lord a hand to that. That's, that is awesome, and that's happening. So, you know, this Christmas, we're obviously going to focus in on the biblical story, the biblical true meaning of Christmas, but uh, I got to say, it kind of cracks me up when I think about all the other traditions, right, that we add to Christmas, and, and there's some, there's some kind of just crazy stuff out there that we do in America that other countries do. So, and it can be confusing, man. If you were like from another planet, you'd be thinking, what are these people doing, right? Why is there a tree in their living room? Stuff like that, right? So here's one. Um, I just want to share a couple. So in Venezuela, they have a tradition of dressing up like Santa and rollerblading to church on Christmas morning. Is that crazy? Yeah? Looks kind of fun, okay? Um, now, Germany has a really weird one, okay? They have a green glass pickle ornament. And on Christmas Eve, when the kids have gone to bed, mom and dad take this green pickle and they, they hide it as deep in the tree as they can. And in the morning, when the children wake up, the first one that finds the pickle gets an extra present. I don't know about your home, but if I did that when my kids were growing up, the tree would be demolished. It just wouldn't even survive that, you know? All right, now how about America, all right? We like to ring in the new year with Black Friday, okay? We love to spend money and shop and, and do all, I mean, and, and, you know, what better way to say Merry Christmas than to be wrestling your fellow shopper to the ground, getting that last TV on sale, right? Now, the last 10 or 15 years, there's been another tradition that's taken place in America, and that is this fella on the screen, the elf on the shelf, Okay, yeah, the elf on the shelf um, ends up in different rooms in children's uh, homes. Santa sends the elves, and um, I want you to know, you kids that still have elves on the shelves, Santa's watching you through this elf, all right? <laughs> See if you're naughty or nice. So that's been a big tradition going on. Now, this is an interesting one in the country of Norway. On Christmas Eve, everybody hides their brooms. Because if they don't hide their brooms, later that night, witches will come in, take their broom, and ride around Norway, creating havoc, all right? That's what goes on. So on Christmas Eve, it's like, come on, kids, let's hide the brooms. Woohoo! So that's what they do in Norway. And then finally, in America, we've got this weird tradition called the ugly Christmas sweater, right? Come on. I mean, clap if you own an ugly Christmas sweater. Just let me know. Right, this is the thing, right? The ugly Christmas sweater, and we'll wear these to office Christmas parties or with friends or whatever. It's a thing. But remember, there are people walking around us that don't realize their sweater is an ugly Christmas sweater, okay? So just smile and celebrate them. Let them be who they are, all right? So those are some weird, kind of confusing things regarding Christmas, and, um, and this is where we're going to start, if you got your note sheets out, that Christmas sometimes can be confusing. It can cause confusion. I mean, there is the commercialism of Christmas where, you know, a lot of folks are trying to make a buck during Christmas time. It's the busiest shopping season of the year. And then there's all the secular traditions that we embrace and, and keep adding on to the original Christmas story. I don't know about you, but sometimes as I've been watching the news and am aware of things going on in the world and see the violence in our cities and the crime, as I'll see the wars in other places, I'll be thinking to myself, hey, Lord, isn't Christmas supposed to be a time of peace? A time of peace with you and a time of peace with others. And yet, there just seems to be, man, this world is a mess. And that can be confusing. What's up with that? Or, you know, you might think, well, isn't Christmas supposed to be a time of joy and happiness? And, and deep within, you might say, you know what, if I'm, if I'm honest, I'm not really feeling it. I'm not feeling very joyful 
this time of year. So Christmas uh, can be a time of confusion. And it was confusing even on that first Christmas. Man, the, the, the announcement of Jesus' birth was confusing. And the journey from to, to Bethlehem, that was kind of confusing. And, and the birth itself and a lot of the events following Jesus' birth, all that stuff, just like, really? What was the point of all that? That can be a little confusing. But it's interesting. Throughout all of that, kind of our two main characters that we're thinking about, Joseph and Mary, they were able to take all that confusion and they were able to somehow keep their focus on God throughout it all. And they were able to experience his peace. And that's my prayer for us this morning. Man, no matter where you might be on the emotional scale, my prayer is that you would be able to leave here today with just a little bit more understanding of who God is, how much he loves you, and being able to experience his peace as we look again at the familiar Christmas story. So before we go on, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, Lord, it's interesting. You tell us to remember the cross and the resurrection, but not, not your birth. And yet we do, and we celebrate your coming to us. And yet, Lord, um, just as there was a lot of confusion that first Christmas, there might be confusion in our own lives. If so, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon each and every one of us, and do we, that we might know and experience your peace today, throughout the Christmas season and beyond. Please open our, our hearts and our minds to your word this morning. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So if you've got your uh, note sheets, I'd encourage you to take those out, or if you've got it on the church app or phone, I'm going to take the statement that confusion can lead to peace when we first submit to the will of God like Mary did. Now, as a pastor, I get all kinds of folks that will come into my office and they'll share with me what's going on in their lives. And i got to tell you, folks without peace are typically people who aren't submitting their lives to, to God's will, to his teachings in Scripture. And so that can be a challenge. But Mary wasn't that way. Let's talk a little bit about Mary. Um, back in her time in first century Israel, young girls would be uh, kind of engaged, but a little more serious, betrothed um, to someone, usually kind of right in their early teens, mid-teens. So when you were 14 or 15 years old, you would be uh, betrothed, usually by an arranged marriage to somebody. How's that sound to you guys over here? No thank you. No thank you, right, gotcha. Yeah. But that was Mary's situation, okay? So she was betrothed to a man named, named Joseph, and they lived in kind of this uh, dusty little town in northern Israel around the Sea of Galilee, called Nazareth. So if you have your Bibles, let's get to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 26 with the angel Gabriel. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, Luke, the author, he's starting right off as he's telling the Christmas story. He wants to make two things clear. One, that Mary was a virgin, okay? She'd never been with a man uh, physically. And then number two, that Joseph, uh, the man that she was betrothed to be married to, was of the royal line of King David. Now, what's important about those two things Mary's virginity and Joseph's uh, lineage, his royal heritage with King David, is that they both qualified to have the Messiah, who would be born of a virgin, who would be an ancestor of 
King David and take his throne forever and ever. And so the story goes on in verse 28. The angel Gabriel, he came to Mary and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But Mary was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting might this be. <clears throat> now, put yourself in Mary's shoes, all right? Um, wasn't every day you got a visit from an angel, right? I mean, that would be startling enough. And then she's trying to process, okay, you say that I'm a favored one? That God is with me? What does that even mean? I mean, who am I? I'm a, I'm a nobody. I'm just a young country girl from, from Nazareth, a, a know-nothing town. I mean, what is this all about? So you can understand her, her confusion. Well, Gabriel goes on in verse 30, and the angel said to her, Now, <clears throat> do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So he emphasizes it again. You're favored. This was God's idea. What he has seen in you as a young woman, your character, your faith, your purity. For Mary, you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, put yourself in Mary's shoes. She might be thinking, okay, I'm favored, now I'm going to conceive and have a son. Well, I am betrothed to Joseph, so yeah, that makes sense to me. That'll probably happen, but, but this is different. This feels really kind of different. Of course, I hope to have children someday when I'm officially married, but right now, I'm not with, with any man in that way, Gabriel, and what you're talking about. So that can be a little confusing. Well, Gabriel went on in verse 32 and 33. He describes who her son will be. He will be great. The Greek word is mega, okay? Your son is going to be mega. And he will be called the son of the most high. She would know that, that, that the angel is referring to God Almighty. He will be the son of the most high God, okay? And, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, He's going to sit on the throne of David and rule not only Israel, but the world forever. Verse 33, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. Wow. There is you know, no question that Gabriel is telling Mary she is going to give birth to the Son of God, the expected Messiah. Now, you would think Mary would be, wow, that's awesome. It's not what she's thinking about right now. Mary's not really trying to connect the dots of Old Testament prophecies and, and the baby, okay? She's thinking about the birds and the bees. And she might be 15, but she knows how it works, okay? So in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Since I've never known a man, and what is what it actually literally says, since I've never known a man, I've never been with a man in that way, I know enough about the birds and the bees, Gabriel, how's this going to happen? Because it seemed like Gabriel was coming off like, this is going to happen immediately, all right? And so Mary is, is confused, okay? Um, so then Gabriel explains a little bit more in verse 35. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, God himself. And the power, the Greek word is dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. That dynamite, power of the Most High God will overshadow you. In other words, Mary, it's going to be something this world has never seen before. You're going to conceive without a man. You're going to have a miraculous conception. The birth of your son will be a true miracle of God. He will be the son of God. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. Think of that word holy as being set apart. This one that's going to come from your womb, Mary, this one is set apart unto God. This is God's son that you're going to carry. 
Make no mistake about that. And then he says in verse 37, take it in, Mary, get ready, for nothing is impossible with God. Wow. How would you respond if you were Mary? Gulp. <laughs> wow. Really? I mean, to take all that in at 15. Wow. But I love Mary's response. Despite the confusion, despite being startled in this conversation with not just any angel, this is Gabriel. When, when Joseph would later ask, well, who are you? He says, I'm, I'm, Gabe, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. This angel stood, didn't kneel, didn't say, he stood in the presence of God of God. That's who she was speaking with. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> and I love Mary's response. Verse 38, Mary said to Gabriel, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. See, Mary is trusting that what the angel is saying is true. She is submitting to God's will in her life, even if she's still confused about how this is all going to work out, which you couldn't blame her. And as a matter of fact, this wouldn't be the first time with the events of the birth of Jesus would present what I would call some confusion. I mean, let's fast forward. Four to six months, right after the angel Gabriel visits Mary, I believe, as I'm putting together scripture, the miraculous conception just kind of happened. And so she goes and travels, and she goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth, who was older in age, who was barren, but God did a miracle in her life, and she became pregnant with her husband, and, um, and she was going to have John the Baptist. And so, I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus and John the Baptist, they're cousins. And so, uh, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth and stays there three months or so. And then she makes her way back, okay, and, uh, and she's pregnant. And it becomes obvious. And Joseph had to deal with that. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But suffice it to say... Uh, the birth was going to happen. And at some point, Joseph accepted it, all right? And, and, but Joseph got another message from Caesar. Caesar told Joseph and all of the men in Israel that they had to go register at their ancestral home. And that was because Caesar wanted more money from the Jews. That's why they registered. So... Uh, uh, Joseph, being of the house of David, had to go to Mary, who's pregnant, and say, hey, I got some good news and bad news. Okay, what's the good news? Well, um, I've accepted your condition, and, uh, and I'm happy, I'm honored to have the Son of God with you. She goes, well, what's the bad news? We got to take a 90-mile walk to Bethlehem. 90 miles? Really? Ladies... Let me ask you, okay? Say you're in the same condition as Mary. And your husband says, hey, you want to walk to Fresno with me? Let's go. <laughs> Something like that, okay? You can say, I don't think so, right? And now some of you might be saying, oh, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I heard that Mary rode on a donkey. Couldn't have been that bad. Oh, really? <laughs> think about it, right? Yeah. So, you know, Mary's probably wondering, Really, God? I'm going to have your son, and I've got to go through all of this? Is this really necessary? So you can understand, you can't blame her if she went through periods of confusion. But there is no record of Mary ever complaining. No record of Mary ever disobeying the will of her father. Mary was humble. Mary was faithful. And Mary submitted to the will of God in all areas of her life. 
Let me put this on the screen. Whatever condition Mary might have experienced, whatever confusion, she submitted to God's will and received his peace. Now the question is, how about you? How about me? Uh, you might be going through something in your life that you just don't understand. And you might even be in your prayer life saying, God, why is this happening? Why am I struggling so much in this relationship? Why am I struggling so much in this area of my life? You might be confused. And you might be trying to get an answer and you're not. And you might be frustrated. And you might even want to rebel against God because of that. Listen, I, I want to encourage you. Hang in there. Submit to God's will. Trust in him like Mary did, and you'll experience his peace. We've got a guy uh, in our church, older gentleman. Uh, he wanted to take me out to breakfast this last week. And I thought to myself, oh, good. I need some time with him. I want to be able to hear how he's feeling, um, to try to encourage him. Because he's been through a lot the last two years. This this gentleman in our church, an older fella, um, he lost his wife two years ago in a freak accident. They were just driving around their neighborhood in a golf cart, and she fell out and, and, and died. Um, and two months ago, his 53-year-old son died of COVID um, with no extenuating circumstances. He was healthy. And, uh, and so we went to breakfast. Got realized, <clears throat> this guy, he loves to laugh. He will come up to me every Sunday with a new joke, okay? He's, he's just that kind of guy. And, uh, and he said, yeah, let's go to breakfast. So he pulls up to the church, and uh, I get in his car, and immediately he tells me a joke, all right? And we're laughing. And he says, I'm going to take you to the best breakfast place in town. I said, oh, great. So we pull up, we go into this place, and I could tell he was right, because I was the youngest guy there, and... Uh, they were all like older farmers right in the area. So I figured this has got to be the best, best place in town. And it was. The service was great. The food was awesome. And, and the whole time I'm waiting for my turn to kind of you know, ask him how he's doing, how I can pray for him, encourage him. And the whole time he, he's, he's asking about me. How's your family? How's the church? How can I pray for you? Hey, have you heard this one? And he kept telling me jokes, and we're laughing, we're cracking up. He's telling jokes to the waitress, you know, the whole bit. And finally I said, hey, tell me what's going on, man. He goes, listen. He said, uh, losing my wife and losing my son, that wasn't part of my plan. And I didn't understand what God was doing, what was going on in my life. But I'm going to praise him anyway. And I'm going to be faithful to my God anyway. And I think this world needs more laughter and more joy. And I'm going to bring it. <laughs> what a guy. And I learn. I learn from people like that in our church. Such solid faith. Did he have a right to be confused? Be angry at God? Absolutely. But he was like Mary. He chose to love the Lord regardless, to bless the Lord regardless, to be faithful regardless, and to submit to God's will. Man, you do that, and you'll experience God's peace this Christmas. Secondly, confusion can lead to peace when we sacrifice for the sake of others, like Joseph did. You know, I've found that people who are joyful, people who are Peaceful with God and with others, these are typically people that I would call givers. They're givers. They're not self focused. Their eyes aren't always on themselves. They truly care about the needs, the interests, and the circumstances of other people. And they're looking to give. They're looking to give. Joseph was like that, he was a giver. His story is in the book of Matthew, chapter 1 says this in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, and that means physically, his husband and wife, um, 
she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So apparently Mary hadn't clued Joseph into what was going on when she was already showing. And, you know, his heart must have been broken. But he was a good man. Verse 20, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying it's not from another man, it's from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then Matthew gives a little explanation. He says in verse 22, Now all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 here. We looked at that last week. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us, the message of Christmas and the birth of his son. Verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took his wife, Mary, but he, he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. In other words, he didn't come together with her physically until after Jesus was born, and he called his name Jesus. Now, we're talking about confusion. Joseph also went through a period of confusion as well. I mean, think about it. Mary returns from this visit to her cousin Elizabeth, and apparently she started to show. And you can imagine the confusion in Joseph. How could you do this to me? How could you be unfaithful to me? I loved you. I was so good to you. Mary, how could you do that? And then he's thinking to himself, oh, wow. Now, what, what about the people of Nazareth in this, in this little town? And, and we're walking around, and she's showing, and we're not officially married yet. We're not supposed to be doing that. What are the people going to think? They're gonna, oh, those young people. <laughs> Couldn't wait. I see. And he thought, man, that's going to hurt my reputation. I've spent my lifetime trying to build my reputation to be a man of faith, of God, of character, integrity, moral purity. And now this, I can't explain that. Why would this happen? And then once he was visited by the angel Gabriel in the dream, he said, now, now what's this about her baby isn't from another man, it's from the Holy Spirit? How the heck does that work, right? That's never happened before. That's confusing to him. And, and his name's going to be Jesus? Is, Jesus? I, I wanted to name my first son Joe Jr. What's the matter with that, you know? Jesus? And he's going to save his people from their sin? I, I thought only God could do that. Joseph had reason for all sorts of confusing thoughts in his mind. But you know, we all experience confusion at times. We all experience hurt and pain and frustration at times in our lives. And how we respond matters. Let me say that again, church. How we respond matters. We can learn to be like Mary and submit to God's will. We can learn to be like Joseph and, 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 and make sacrifices and think about others when we're confused and frustrated. We can put our trust in God and believe that he is working out his purposes for a reason in our lives. And once we come to that conclusion, then we'll experience his peace. Not until... Let's consider the sacrifices that, that Joseph made. Putting himself second 
or third, putting God's will above his own, Mary's situation above his own. The Bible tells us in that passage we read that Joseph was kind and just. He didn't exercise his right. If he wanted to, he could have publicly shamed Mary for what she did. If he wanted to, by the Old Testament law, he could take her outside of the city and he could have had her stoned to death if he really wanted to push that. Joseph wasn't going to do that. He sacrificed his right to divorce her after the angel Gabriel explained to him what was going on. He, I think he did have to sacrifice his reputation while he and Mary were walking around town and she's showing. What are they going to do? Explain that, oh, it wasn't me, it was the Holy Spirit. People aren't going to get that, right? But he had to walk with her in humiliation as others wondered What's going on with that young couple? Boy, man, Joseph, we thought better of you. He sacrificed his own plans for his marriage, raising his own family, and he took on the responsibility of raising the Son of God. (laughs) No pressure. No pressure. Wow. And finally, Joseph sacrificed his own sexual desires and didn't come together with Mary until after Jesus was born. Now Joseph could have acted out on all the reasons he had to be confused, on all the reasons he had to be frustrated and angry and bitter towards God, but but he didn't do that. If he did, we would have had a very different story. But Joseph was a faithful man a kind man, a loving man. And he chose to believe Gabriel's words about the conception, about Jesus. He put God's will first. He put Mary's needs and her situation before his own. And I believe because Joseph was a man who understood sacrifice, that he was also a man that understood God's peace. That's a peace that you and I can have. But I understand that maybe some of you at this time, you're confused at what God's doing in your life. You don't understand what's going on at school. You don't understand what's going on with your job or your career. Man, things just aren't going the way you had planned with that sports team you might be on. Hey, God, what's going on with my relationships, my friendships, or my relationship with my parents or as a parent with my kids or my grandkids or my spouse. Man, things aren't going well, and I don't understand why. Hey, God, things aren't going well with my health. I don't understand this illness. Why did you allow me to get sick in this way? How am I going to provide and take care of, of my family with this? Or, you know, Lord, what's going on with my finances? Why is it so hard? I don't understand. And we can act out. And we can get mad at God, and we can rebel, or we can choose to trust him and believe in him and love him. Take our eyes off ourselves, put it onto others. I find that when I'm able to take my problems and just give them to the Lord and put my eyes on the needs of others, that helps me experience the peace of God in my own life. When I get my eyes off myself and onto others. The Bible says it this way in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That was Joseph. Is that you? Is that me? Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That was Joseph. Is it you? Is it me? See, I believe that if we do this, that if we let go of our selfishness and our self-centeredness and be a giver, this Christmas, caring about the interests of others just as much as ourselves, 
we're going to experience God's joy and we're going to experience his peace. I really believe that. And finally, confusion can lead to peace when we seek the Prince of Peace this Christmas. And that's Jesus. The underlying message of Christmas is peace through Jesus. Trusting Jesus, we get peace with God. Having Jesus in our lives, we have peace with one another. Now, in 1914, there was not peace between nations. World War I had begun. The Germans and their allies on one side, the French and English and their allies on the other. They had dug in on the Western Front between Germany and France, a 400-mile line where the two sides trenched in. It was brutal warfare, that which the world had never seen before. Thousands were dying more quickly than ever in modern warfare. Five months into the war, it was Christmas time. And Pope Benedict XV at that time asked for a ceasefire, just for Christmas. The military leaders on both sides said no. That's not going to happen. On the night of Christmas Eve, somewhere along the Western Front, German soldiers began singing Silent Night in their trenches. Across no man's land, to the other side, the French and English soldiers heard them, and they sang back Silent Night in their own language. The German soldiers responded with another Christmas carol. The English and French shared one in their language again, and they shared different Christmas carols that night. You can check it out on Google. It happened, all right? It happened. So on Christmas morning, some brave soldiers on both sides, they laid down their weapons and they came out of their trenches and met each other in the middle, in the line of battle, in no man's land, where they greeted each other in the name of Christ, where they exchanged gifts of things like jams and uh, newspapers and, and cigarettes, I'm told in the story. They even played a little game of soccer for a while. And then they helped each other Bury the dead on both sides. And they prayed over their lost companions. Even amidst the hostilities of war, soldiers sought peace as well as the peace of Christ. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, he's the answer. He's the answer to the confusion that you might be feeling in your own life, and he's the answer to peace within our homes, within our communities, our nation, and our world. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ.